link that is on the, the page here, but we also sent it in the invite. So if you go into that, then you just put your name in with that ID number and then you can start to um, re re get uh, claim the CME credit for this presentation. So the other piece that I think we need to just remind everybody is to place yourselves on mute unless you're asking a question. And we do have a Q&A session at the end of the meeting. Um, so if you can hold those questions till then, that'd be great. And I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie Mills Taylor to give the introduction for Dr. Donaraj. Okay. All right. First of all, we are very lucky to have Dr. Donaraj at St. Mary. He recently joined the orthopedic experts at St. Mary Orthopedics, including John, Drs. John Abalone, David Catilli, George Catilli, Richard Catilli, Edward Ford, and George Stolsteimer. He earned his medical degree from the University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio, and completed his residency in orthopedic surgery at New York University Hospital for Joint Diseases, and a fellowship in orthopedic sports medicine at University of Pennsylvania Hospital System, which did include a partnership with Children's Hospital Pennsylvania, CHOP, for additional training in pediatric sports medicine. Dr. Donaraj is a member of the Arthroscopy Association of North America, American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine and holds a subspecialty certificate in orthopedic sports medicine issued by the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and served on the Princeton Fitness and Wellness Center's Medical Advisory Board and is a principal reviewer for the American Journal of Sports Medicine. He also served as a ringside physician for the New Jersey State Athletic Commission as well as the orthopedic consultant to the American Repertory Ballet, Princeton Ballet School. He cares for patients facing a variety of orthopedic issues, specializing in the orthopedic medical needs of the sports community. He sees patients at the following location, that would be St. Mary Orthopedics, 1203 Langhorne Newtown Road, that's our St. Clair building in Suite 120. And Dr. Donaraj, are you also over at Feasterville? I am, yes. I'm okay, also um, our Feasterville location, 178 okay. West Street Road in Feasterville. Yes. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Stephanie. I really, really appreciate the introduction. Um, and it was a great introduction. Um, yes, I'm, I'm excited to give this talk. I'm excited to be here. Um, it, it's I've only been here a few months, but it, it's been great. I, I practiced in uh, Jersey at Penn Medicine for six years. Um, and like uh, Stephanie was mentioning, I did my fellowship at Penn in uh, Philadelphia, where a lot of the things I'll talk about, we, we kind of gleaned and we studied down there. And so, I, you know, I'm really excited to give this talk. I'm excited to be here. It's just um, this is one of my my passions, uh, joint preservation, trying to keep people's joints healthy um, and uh, free of injury. It's kind of my philosophy behind how I take care of patients, because I'll start with the very beginning of how what we think about when we talk about joint injuries to all the way to the technology that we have today. So it's a really neat, I've given this talk a few times, really neat kind of spectrum that you'll be able to learn um, how we how we look at things. So my, my talk today is entitled Emerging Technologies in Orthopedics and it's specifically Joint Preservation. So I, I am a sports medicine specialist. Um, my, my passion is um, keeping people from having replacement, you know, the other facets of um, orthopedics involved uh, joint replacement, uh, spine surgery, pediatrics, oncology, mine is sports medicine, but specifically it's joint preservation. How do we keep people's joints healthy, um, pain-free? How do we keep people active and moving and obviously uh, participate in sports? So a little agenda of how I'll go through this is <clears throat> just talk about joint preservation in general, what, what a joint is, you know, the anatomy, some of the basics, how injuries occur, um, and what are the different types of injuries that cause our joints to have problems. Then I'm going to go into some of the newer techniques um, that we can employ now, which include cartilage re regeneration, meniscal transplants, uh, that's specifically in the knee. And then we'll talk a little bit about the shoulder and superior capsule reconstruction, where we can um, really save the shoulder as well. And then I'll go on to hip arthroscopy, another new kind of uh, field in, in orthopedics where we can we can save the hip by putting a small camera and doing things minimally invasively and then we'll conclude with some questions and things like that so i like to talk about joint preservation from 
an ancient standpoint. Okay, so this picture on the left, or maybe to your right, depending on how you're looking at it, is is obviously an ancient drawing. Okay, um, and what they're doing in this position in this picture is they're actually reducing someone's shoulder dislocation. Someone's shoulder is dislocated in that drawing, and by using what's called a counter traction maneuver, traction counter traction, they're able to pull that arm and put that ball back in the socket. Now this procedure on your right is, is being used today um, and you know using a foot in the armpit which is not nowadays kind of recommended especially in the ER setting because you can cause damage to the axillary vessels but in, in a pinch in field medicine in the in the woods or whatever it might be the best way to put someone's shoulder back into place. Now how did we come up with this? This method of reduction is called the Hippocratic method literally from the father of medicine we've been having uh, joint injuries from the beginning of time. Um, I, I give, I, like I, uh, Stephanie mentioned, I, I do work with, I used to work with the Princeton Ballet and the New Jersey Athletic Commission, and I would do fight medicine. So literally some of these doctors in the very beginning of time in, in modern medicine were the gladiator doctors. They were like the team docs for the gladiator arena. So they came up with these methods from the very beginning of time. Um, what, what is the joint? So the joint is made up of, of, of three, you know, entities. It's the cartilage. The cartilage is the kind of the shiny end of a chicken bone, as you imagine, the white part that allows for the bones to move across each other without friction. It's highly, um, uh, vi uh, it's vi viscoelastic. It, it's, it's got a very low coefficient of friction, which is a term that um, measures uh, friction. And it's literally this equivalent or even better than ice moving on ice. The synovium is the lining of the joint, which creates the fluid. You know, if you can imagine a, an engine moving about, it needs motor oil, which is a lubricating fluid, and your joint has a lining that creates that fluid called synovial fluid. The other thing in a joint are the ligaments. All the ligaments are the, are the uh, tissues that hold the two bones together. Keep that joint moving in concert, and, and all these things working together, along with the musculature, provide what, what is known as your joint. That cartilage is very important, you know, specifically that's kind of where our holy grail of, of, of medicine and, and joint preservation is, is, is saving the cartilage, that, that shiny end of the chicken bone, if you imagine. It's called hyaline cartilage. It's a very specific type of cartilage made up of what's called type two collagen fibers, the fibers in our body made out of collagen and chondroitin sulfate. You can, you can probably remember people take glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate um, tablets to kind of hypothetically improve their joint health. But this is what provides that lubricated um, frictionless surface. OK, so otherwise, when we walk, the bones would grind against each other. So that's why we have cartilage and it's very important. It's not just shiny and, and, and neat to look at. It's it's very intricate. It literally has a biomechanical network or a framework that allows for the most efficient movement and, and, and shock absorbency uh, properties. So it's specifically made up of cells called chondrocytes, which are cells of the body that make cartilage the makeup or cartilage, and it's got a very intricate lattice network uh, made up of proteoglycans, chondroitin sulfate, different uh, proteins that allow for that very specific shock absorber um, type of property. Now, how do we get joints injured? Okay, there's obviously multiple ways these things happen. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, most of the time injuries, but we'll go into the other ones. But injuries are obviously trauma, you know, fractures, uh, sports injuries where you twist or something pops, that's it's a very common cause of joint injuries. Obviously, sometimes there are things that are just plain mechanical. Sometimes we are born with our limb out of alignment, and therefore certain areas of the joint have more pressure than normally than they normally do. So they can cause problems with alignment. Obviously, degenerative father time is obviously another way we have problems with the joints, arthritis, just normal wear and tear. And there are other things that cause joint problems, infections, metabolic syndromes, medical, um, medical uh, um, causes, including inflammatory uh, arthritis, those kind of things can cause joint infection. So the muscular skeletal is in them injuries. If you look at this video, I'll show it a few times, there is a direct blow uh, to the knee. Okay, that's obviously a, a football injury, where if you look at it again, and I love to show it, that helmet hits that knee right on the knee inverts that is a knee dislocation you're obviously going to tear cartilage and probably multiple ligaments um, when it comes to these knee injuries actually two-thirds of them are non-contacts so this is a professional soccer player he's actually um one of the world cup soccer players for england national team he just pivots on that left knee 
boom, pops his ACL. If you just see it again, he just pivots on that left knee, turns, and you see the shift. That's an ACL tear. That's how it happens. It's non-contact two-thirds of the time. But we have the technology to fix these people and actually make them, you know, if not better when we fix these people. This is what you'd see in an exam room after that kind of injury. This is called a Lachman exam where the, the, the surgeon is holding the thigh bone with one hand and the shin bone. And you can see this abnormal movement. The knee should not move that much. The main job of the ACL is to hold those two bones together so they don't move. Okay, so this is a contact injury during a, a professional fight. This is obviously brought to you by the UFC. Um, this shows a pretty bad injury. Well, they'll show this again when he kicks the opponent. I want you to watch that leg. It's pretty gruesome, so cover your eyes if you don't like to see that. Obviously, his tibia, his shin bone, completely breaks, and he steps down on it. I, I love giving this talk in person because I, I usually can see the oohs and the ahs and people covering their face, but I can't see you guys right now, so I don't get that satisfaction. But um, obviously, that's a broken tibia. Um, you know, it's fixed with a nail. A long nail is how we fix a mid-shaft uh, long bone fracture. And it's secured on both sides. And those actually heal well. Now, that's not a typical joint injury. If you notice, the long bone is in the middle of the shin, uh, uh, and it's between the knee and the ankle. So it's actually a better injury to have than your joint injury because, as I talk about, cartilage will not heal on its own, but bones will. Here's another non-contact. This is soccer. And watch the girl in yellow as she pivots. Well, there's a sort of a contact there, but the main thing is that she she hits another player and her you'll zoom in here. It's kind of gruesome, but the kneecap is dislocated. You don't see the kneecap in the front of the knee. It's off to the side and you can see the end of the femur there. That's a patella dislocation where the kneecap's sitting off the side. This is what our ER colleagues would do is basically put it back into place for you. So you'll see it pop back into place. All right, see that pop back into place? So it pops back into place. But what happens after that is something like this. This is the inside of a knee where you can see the white, which is the cartilage, but you can see a large hole in the cartilage. And that's a cartilage injury. So uh, that patella dislocation, as it's being either when it's dislocating or being put back into place, can definitely shear the cartilage off. And so this is the problem. And like I said, there's multiple ways this happens. That is one of them. Mechanical, real quickly, is um, is just your limb alignment. Sometimes you're born with a little bit of malalignment, and you can put undue stress on certain parts of the joint. And and this is anatomic, and in some things, sometimes physiologic. We have people who have a little bit of a bowed leg or knocked knee. Those are called uh, valgus and varus alignments. Uh, women actually have an increased valgus, which is a kind of knocked knee moment at the knee. And it's just because of how their pelvis is shaped. So we see these uh, not only physiologic, but also in gender. <clears throat> arthritis is very common. Uh, it's just normal wear and tear of the joint. Osteoarthritis is that term, when it's mechanical wear of the joint after time and life. Sometimes just plain gravity is what's the cause. Rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory component. Um, inflammatory arthritis where you, you have breakdown of your joint from your own um, immune system. These, these um, immune complexes can get deposited in the joint due to a, a hypersensitivity, a hyperimmune response. Post-traumatic just means after an injury, you might have a cartilage deficit, but it gets worse and worse and worse. Or after a fracture, if you break the uh, end of the um, long bone where the joint is, you can heal, but you can have arthritis. Septic arthritis is when an infection occurs in a joint and you can have breakdown of the cartilage from the bacteria themselves. So arthritis is very, very easy to tell. A quick x-ray tells us that on, our, on your left here, you see the normal knee x-ray with plenty of joint space between the, the femur, which is the thigh bone and the tibia, which is the shin bone. On the other view here, it's worn out. The two bones are touching. It's very sclerotic, which means that you see this increased whiteness, which is like a marbleizing of the bone. Um, and so this is an arthritic knee. <clears throat> so once again, you have all those causes of joint problems. 
you have these multiple ways that they happen, but what do we do when we happen, when these happen, okay? We, we've got to fix these problems and we have technology. The problem is that when those happen, you, you don't have hyaline cartilage, which are, if you remember, I talked to you, that's the joint lining, that specific specialized cartilage. You have something called fibrocartilage, which is scar cartilage. It lacks that very intricate lattice network of the proteoglycans, the proteins, and the chondrocytes that make up a really um, a, a very good biomechanically uh, efficient cushion. So it's just a scar cartilage. And it's made out of a different type of cartilage. When we, we looked at the um, actual histology of it, it's a type one cartilage. But like I said before, it does not resemble normal cartilage and lacks the biomechanical properties and it is not as durable. So our goals are obviously to restore that articular surface, regenerate that cartilage, okay? Um, we have sometimes have to realign the limb, uh, sometimes have to obviously line up a fracture, those kind of things. But our main goal is to prevent one area of damage to go on to global arthritis of a knee. Sometimes it's like I said, it's alignment issues. If somebody's alignment is off, they're prone to dislocations, things like that. We can realign the bone. We can do osteotomies where we cut the bone and realign it and fix it with plate and screws. But you can see the difference on this x-ray of the on the left where it's nice and straight, the limbs, and you have your what's called your mechanical alignment it goes through the top of your hips all the way to the center of your ankles. And that's how they should look. But if you have a little bit of a uh, malalignment of one of the limbs due to congenital or even trauma, then you'll have increased wear in one part of the joint. Ligaments are obviously important. If you remember those those videos where the uh, unfortunate football player was tackled and he, you could tell his knee hyperextended and likely dislocated, you're going to tear the ligaments. You know, there's multiple ligaments in the knee. Um, the the most important ones are the cruciates, which stand for anterior and posterior cruciate. Their job is to keep the knee from going forward and backwards. As you can see on the left, the normal knee versus the right, the ligaments in his, um, insufficient knee shows that, that those two bones are definitely not aligned. And that x-ray just shows me that the ligaments are torn. The other thing is here's the shoulder. The shoulder is a ball and socket joint, okay? You can see the collarbone and the rib cage, but the ball and socket should be lined up. If you look at the left, it is, okay? But on the right, what's going on there? That humeral head, the ball is high. It's definitely not in the socket. That's the sign that the rotator cuff, which is the ligaments and tendons that <clears throat> attach to the humeral head are torn and therefore not allowing proper alignment or biomechanical movement, proper movement of the, of the shoulder. So we can fix those things. And that's why what we're talking about today is some of the techniques we have to do these. So in terms of the cartilage, we can regenerate it now um, in, and we can make it almost as efficient as it was previously. Leaving scar cartilage was one option where you just kind of go in there and debris the area of injury and you poke some holes into the bone and get that scar cartilage to form. Nowadays, we can transplant tissue and that's part of, you know, my, my kind of goal and philosophy in, in treating patients is to keep their knee as healthy as, they, as we can and as close to as possible as the day they were born. So we have ways of doing that where we can implant cartilage. We can implant their own cartilage and bone. We can take donor cartilage, things like that. So the main thing about this is, is, is also something that patients have to understand is that it's not repaving a road, okay? If you have arthritis that's global, we cannot fill all that cartilage up at this point in, in time and technology. Knee replacement is the best or replacement surgery. But if it's a pothole, a focal deficit that's actually well, um, um, uh, um, the edges are actually well delineated, we can fix that. We can refill the pothole. We can't repave the road. If you imagine a pothole is something called edge loading when you drive over it in a car, if your tire is big, bigger than the pothole, you don't see a problem. You don't necessarily fill it. But as the pothole, you know, as you've seen after rain, things like that, as people drive over it, it gets bigger and bigger. And eventually your tire will dip into that pothole. And that's kind of what happens with the cartilage defects in the knee as they get bigger. And our goals are to prevent that. <clears throat> and we call it hyaline light cartilage because we, we can't get it back to the day you were born perfectly in terms of its network and its structure. So it, it's called hyaline light cartilage. And I also wanted to say, it, feel free to interrupt if you have questions. I'm, I'm happy to take them. I know this is um, done virtually, but so I can't see a hand, but I know you can kind of chime in if you if you feel uh, like you have a question. 
So one thing I want to talk about that's new and it's it's interesting is what's called ACI. It's called autologous chondrocyte implantation. It's it's um it's a good technique for larger defects, which are usually about 1.5 centimeters squared or greater. We can take the cells from the patient, taking a small biopsy, and regrow them in a lab. And we grow them in a lab for about six to eight weeks to get a, a larger amount, and then we can re-implant them into the knee. So usually this is done, like I said, in, in two stages. You'll first take the cartilage from the patient, you'll regrow it, and then you'll paste it back into the knee, okay? So literally, you'll carve out a little um, uh, uh, scaffold that's the same size as the defect of cartilage. We'll use a membrane, and then we'll inject the cells from the patient back onto that defect. And so this is their own cells that are alive and basically just regenerate that cartilage lesion more efficiently than mother you know, nature could without this. This is showing a patch being placed on and sewn back into the cartilage defect. This is previously how we did it probably five years ago. Now, um, I, I would say just in the past three to five years, it was FDA approved in this country to have it performed with a, with a matrix. It's called MACI, which stands for matrix autologous chondrocyte implantation. So the cells actually come nowadays implanted onto a thin membrane that I will cut out and just paste back onto the cartilage defect. It's still a two-stage procedure, but it, it, it obviates the need for re for sewing the graft into place, which um, decreases the operative time. So that's kind of how you do it. It goes from the lab all the way, from the patient all the way to the lab, to the bench work of, of tissue culturing and, and regrowing these, and then implanting it back into a patient. So it's amazing the technology we can do um, to this day. The, the, the newest thing, like I said, with the matrix is amazing because they have perfected that matrix to have type one collagen on one side and type two on another to make it perfect environment at the cellular level for those cells to regenerate. We do have good follow-up on these. Um, you know, we've seen these out for over 20 years. Obviously these came from initially Scandinavia and uh, different parts of the world. Um, in Europe, but as we've seen this this technique get better and better, we, we've been able to follow it and see that it really does have good long-term results. Another thing is kind of what we call biocartilage, something I, I use quite often. It's a one-stage procedure where it's not actual live cells, but it's an extracellular matrix. It's It's got all the components that the cells need to make cartilage. It just needs the cells. So we paste it into a defect and we actually um, make, drill some small holes into the defect and allow the cells to come in and fill that defect. So here's just a so animation. The matrix is developed from allograft artificial <clears throat> cartilage taken from sterile donor tissue and meant to serve as a framework for the body to create new healthy cartilage. So we scrape the old cartilage, the scar cartilage off because you need to get access to the bone itself. In this procedure, <clears throat> the surgeon makes the surface even and multiple small holes are drilled in the bone mm -hmm. to help promote the healing process. That's called drilling or microfracture. It just, it allows those cells that are coming from the bone itself, the stem cells to <clears throat> infiltrate the lesion itself and populate it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then we'll paste the cartilage right onto that, sorry, the cartilage matrix. After it is dry, the surgeon uses a delivery needle to place the biocartilage onto the surface. We'll kind of spread it out a curve to fill it. Is used to smooth out the biocartilage. To and the then we'll paste some it. glue, which is called fibrin glue. Then a little a thin light layer of natural <clears throat> fibrin glue is placed over the biocartilage. It just holds it in place. Procedure. Biocartilage may help to create new articular cartilage by extracellular matrix is developed. So that's a good procedure for a one stage operation. Now that's only that's only ideal for smaller lesions. Okay, as the lesion gets larger, you would ha be better off using your own cells. But if it's a small lesion to see at the time of surgery, we can treat it right on the spot with this type of technique. The meniscus is the shock absorber between the two bones themselves. Not only uh, does the cartilage help with lubrication and with uh, shock absorption, the meniscus, it's like a rubbery tissue that sits between the two bones in your knee. It's a common thing that gets torn, okay? 
Um, we go in their scopes. It's one of the most common procedure we do in orthopedics is to scope a knee and kind of remove a meniscus tear. If the tear is flapped, like you saw in that first part of the video, it can act like a piece of torn carpet under a door, getting caught every time you open and close that door. I tell people it's like a rock in your shoe. So we remove that torn portion or smooth it back. Sometimes if the tear, you see on the, on the far right here, if it's kind of near the edge of the tissue, we want to repair it. So we'll sew it back to the, um, to the, to the actual um, synovium. Now, if you tear your whole meniscus or you have multiple tears and we have to take it out piece by piece, um, eventually you have no meniscus and you obviously go on to arthritis. You have no shock absorption. So we can transplant a meniscus. And we will get a donor that's matched to your exact size of your knee and we will transplant a fresh frozen allot graft, which is a donor tissue from someone else, into your knee. Now, sometimes we don't have that available. You know, we really have to have it size matched for your knee. We can't just get any size meniscus and sometimes they're not available. So they're working on technologies to where we can regenerate the meniscus, okay? So sometimes we're looking at um, uh, 3D remodeling, things like that, but we're trying to find something that we can sew back in that would actually take the place of your meniscus. There's technology coming out um, and it obviously studies that are not that um, uh, or that recent in the United States, but have been out in Europe for quite some time, that people are experimenting with putting in a scaffold after they measure the defect and sewing in a kind of a, um, a, a matrix that your cells will grow into and recreate a meniscus. So these are neat and exciting things that are kind of on the horizon in our country. Um, they're, they're, they've been out in different countries for a while, but we are starting to get some, some short-term data from this type of procedure shows the cells themselves kind of reintegrating into that into that matrix kind of neat. Um, this is from Europe as well. Um, they they have tried a poly, uh, polyurethane scaffold, kind of like what I showed there, and they've had some good you know two year data things like that. Nothing too long term, and this was probably about five years ago. So. Um, we haven't seen too much else in the United States with this. Now, hypothetically, let's say the meniscus is gone. Wouldn't it be great to just put in like a gel implant? And they're looking at that as well. And when I give this talk about, I think, three to five years ago, there'd only been maybe five of these implanted in the world. Um, and they had been done mostly in Europe and Israel in different parts of the world. Um, our FDA is robust and the, the, um, the criteria to have something approved in this country is very robust. It requires animal studies, and long-term data for us to be able to do it. So we see it initially in other countries and we get the data and then we start to try to you know, do it in our country. So we do have some data in our country. This is from our Academy of, of um, Sports Medicine Society. So that meniscus implant, they are starting to look at, and this is done just with a few patients, but if you look at the date of that, it's just this year, July 8, 2021, some very recent data showing that Eventually, some of these treatments will be on available for us, but I, I wanted you to see from, from the very beginning to now what we have out there. Um, 3D implants. We are looking at taking a scan of someone's knee. Um, well, actually, this is an animal study. They're doing it in a, in a um, sheep using a 3D printer and making the same kind of deal, a meniscal scaffold that matches your joint and your size. They're doing this currently in sheep. Stimulate the body's internal stem cells to regenerate the meniscus. So three teams got together and put that scaffold with the two proteins inside the sheep meniscus that was replaced. And the sheep, after they received this 3D meniscus scaffold with the two proteins delivered in sequence, and finally regenerate the meniscus. So within about six weeks or so, on average, a sheep were, were, the sheep were able to undergo weight bearing and local mm -hmm. motion percentage. So that's good for sheep. I mean, we're not there yet with humans, <laughs> but uh, animal models are always the first thing we do um, to test efficacy and kind of try out these, these techniques. The thing he mentioned is that we can implant anything into the knee, but we may not have the right um, biological milieu to make it work. We may not have the right uh, growth factors, cytokines, those kind of things that allow cells to differentiate into cartilage or meniscus or or even synovium. We, we don't know that just yet. So we're experimenting with that. That's all 
done in the lab. So the shoulder, if you remember, we can fix rotator cuff tears. The rotator cuff is the group of four muscles, as you can see, that attaches to the humeral head and moves that ball and socket in space, okay? If you tear it, we can fix it. And a lot of times, this is one of the most common procedures we do. We go in with the camera in the back of the shoulder, and we make small poke holes throughout the shoulder, and we can bring in instruments in. So that's the rotator cuff right there. It's the tendon that should be attached to this area here is a hole in the tendon, a tear. And we will fast forward here, kind of try to pull it back into place, make sure it's fixable. We put in some small uh, poke holes into the bone itself after we clean up the old rotator cuff tear, rotator cuff tissue. <clears throat> and we put in some small anchors, okay? These anchors are now bioabsorbable. You used to use metal anchors. Now we use a kind of a composite material that's made out of a, a combination of calcium and phosphate. And it's basically the same kind of material that bone is made out of. And it dissolves into bone in a couple months. Those anchors, they're attached to these really heavy, um, tough sutures. And we use a device, all done through a camera, to sew the tendon with those sutures, okay? And we, we depending on the size of the tear, we sometimes have to repeat that process. And then we'll pull on those, on those sutures, as you'll see here, after, and then bring the, sh the, the tear back down to the bone, okay? And then we just re-anchor it with an additional two sutures. So that's how we can fix a rotator cuff pretty quick and, and pretty efficiently through small, small poke holes, okay? That's called a rotator cuff repair. Now, what happens when the rotator cuff is gone or it's been too long and we cannot fix the rotator cuff? That happens when someone has retore or tore their tissue qualities and great and it's retracted and scarred in, we sometimes can't sew it back to the bone. So we now have an option called superior capsule reconstruction. Uh, we've been doing it here at, at um, St. Mary's for, for the past couple months where I've been, been able to implant a biologic graph, okay? This I will measure out is a technique the defect and I will cut out a piece of tear. dermal allograft, which is dermal allograft in this technique. skin tissue, and I will measure that defect and re-implant it. So it, it's a pretty neat technique. What its job is, is holding that humeral head back in the socket. So when even someone has torn the rotator cuff and, and, and really can't have it fixed anymore, they're not stuck with just having a shoulder replacement. We can save the shoulder at this time by implanting this tissue um, that, that we haven't done previously. This was pretty much about five to 10 years as well um, in this country. It's been done previously in Japan for several years prior. It's a pretty neat technique. Just once again, through small poke holes, I can sew the graft and then I will under camera visualization, push it into the joint and then secure it with the same kind of anchors. Let's see that kind of process here. And once that's you know measured and put in, I will sew it back to whatever native tissue the patient has to really secure it and kind of cover the humeral head so the patient doesn't go on to arthritis. So it's a good technique we can do arthroscopically. There's even newer things coming out that maybe even obviate the need for this in terms of in terms of like cushioning this area in the in the joint when you've torn your rotator cuff. So that here's an example of um, a surgical example. I think this was in Princeton, but this is when we 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 have a camera set up. We have the patient in this arm exposed. I will cut out the graft, and then basically I'll bring it to the arm, and I will put all my sutures right through that graft. And under camera visualization, I will push that back into place. So it's kind of neat. Hip arthroscopy, so we can save the hip. People can go on to hip arthritis. It's very common. They can get need, have a need for hip replacement. But nowadays we can go in there with a small camera prior to that need and um, fix certain aspects. A lot of times it's bone that needs to be shaved down, whether it be on the socket or on the ball itself. Some people are born with just a little bit of extra bone on the, on the left is pure normal. On the right, it's called a cam deformity. It's just an extra bump of bone on that femoral head. So when you raise your hip up, it catches and it can cause arthritis, pain, and, and someone will need hip replacement earlier. So nowadays I can go with a small camera and remove that bone. Sometimes people have overhang of their socket and we can remove that bone as well. Femoral acetabular impingement is a well-described pathologic condition 
that can lead to painful cartilage injury, labral tears, and arthritis. Impingement can occur as a result of femoral sided impingement, known as cam impingement, acetabular rim impingement, also known as pincer impingement, or a combination of both. The pincer type lesion refers to the over coverage of the acetabulum. In high degrees of flexion, those two bones will bump right there. Hits the femoral neck, and that causes arthritis. In degeneration, ossification, and tears of the antero superior labrum. That's the other thing, is the labrum itself, which is the lining of the socket, can tear because of that pinching. And so when it tears, you have fluid that leaks from that socket, and it's joint fluid, and so you, you don't have a great suction seal. So we can go in there with the camera and sew those labrums back to the bone. <clears throat> Here's an example. With the camera, we go in there, we kind of peel it back, then I'll wrap suture around the labrum. Remove I'll remove what ex excess bone there is that's kind of pinching. And I'll put some anchors, which are just small little screws, into the socket to hold that labrum in place and recreate that suction seal um, as well. So this is the setup for that. We have a patient, you know, on an on a OR table, but we have to pull traction. So we have to put their leg in a device that's in like a boot and pull traction with the crank to kind of open up the socket so I can actually get my instruments in there. We use a, a, a C-arm, which is a intraoperative x-ray machine to visualize me getting into the socket because the hip socket's very deep. It's not like just through the skin and the knee and the shoulder. It's deep in the pelvis, so we have to use these uh, x-rays and things. But here's a good example of that bump in the bone, and after shaving it down, you have more of a smooth contour of the head and neck junction. So, you know, I, I kind of wanted to just glean on some very neat new things in orthopedics that are emerging. These techniques really help save the joint um, after someone has an injury. But the point of all this and the point of my philosophy behind how I treat my patients is, you know, obviously prevention is key. If you can do something to prevent these injuries from the first place, you're so much better off. It's, it's purely a matter of joint health, you know, just normal lifestyle changes, weight loss, uh, proper exercise, those kind of things. We've seen that these things that they seem kind of, you know, arbitrary, oh, you know, stretching, you know, strengthening and conditioning, they can cause and help um, prevent joint injury. They can, they can be a really major factor. We've seen uh, studies that show that a proper warm up in soccer and female athletes and collegiate athletes will prevent ACL rupture. And if you can imagine going through an ACL is a big deal, six to nine month uh, recovery, a big surgery. If we can do a certain something to just really prevent it in the first place, that's what I tell my patients and really try to glean on that prevention is key, education is key, and, and not going out on the field with 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 just uh, you know your body is a big black box and you're just gonna you know get hurt without knowing what's happening. Um, arthritis, you know, arthritis is a common problem. It's it's simple things such as weight loss reduction, but exercise and movement is key. So um, your body is a machine. You know, you can't go 50 years without um, doing your car having any maintenance on it. And the body's the same thing. It needs maintenance. It craves exercise and, and mobility. Here's a great example of that. This is from the Arthritis Foundation. Moving is the best medicine. I totally agree with that. Even... Coming back to full circle at our talk on the ancient antiquity and how joints uh, have been looked at from the beginning of time, they have known this as well. Here's a quote from Hippocrates stating that walking is man's best medicine. So although we have all these wonderful technologies available to us and they're emerging, they're exciting, I always tell patients, you know, getting back to the grassroots of, of prevention, of uh, exercise, joint health, those are the ways that you can not end up on the OR table in the first place. All right, so with that, here are some of the um, additional um, housekeeping slides. Obviously, I have no disclosures um, relevant to this talk. And I will end there and entertain any questions or, or comments. All right, All thanks, right. Dr. Donner. Yeah. That was, that a, was a, a great, great presentation, and I love the video. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, they, they kind of add a little context sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So
so, um, there, um, is there is a couple is a of couple questions. questions. Sure. So, so after, after someone, someone gets, gets a cartilage, cartilage implanted, implanted back, back into their, into their, their knee, knee, is their, their knee brand, brand new, new again? again? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, that's the point. No, it is not brand new again. So we implant cartilage and we do our best with all the technologies we have to make that hyaline light cartilage. We want it to have that cushioning effect, that biomechanical properties, the, that elastic properties. It's never the same. There, there's always a bit of scar cartilage in there that it's not always the same, but it can hopefully prevent that defect from getting worse and bigger and bigger. So we can, you know, make it, you know, I'd say 75 to 80% better, but it's not going to be like the day a patient's born. So it's always good to understand that. It's a good question. Okay, great. Um, how, um, how is the shoulder, the shoulder able, able to move, move again, again after, after severe, severe cap, cap, cap reconstruction? reconstruction? If the, if the tissue, tissue implant, implant is not, not muscle muscle or tendon. Yeah, that's a great question. So on the shoulder, if we do a rotator cuff, we sew their tendon back to the bone. Now, like I said, if that tendon is worn out, torn beyond repair, then we implant that allograft. And that allograft just is a donor tissue of, of what's called dermal allograft. It's a piece of skin. It's not a tendon. So it doesn't have contractile property, you know. But the point is people are able to move their shoulder because that ball is back in the socket. It acts like what's called a reverse trampoline. When that ball tries to come up, it keeps it down. So then other muscles in your shoulder, including your deltoid, they take over and you're still able to raise your arm overhead because of that. So that's that's a great question. It's not replacing the tendon, but it's replacing the biomechanical um, lever arm of the shoulder to make it move again. And, and, and just and a just personal, personal question. question. From mm -hmm. my experience when I was when a nurse on the nurse floor, on the floor yes. a lot, a of, lot patients of patients have pain, pain after, after rotator, rotator cuff, cuff surgery. surgery. So what, yeah. is, what causing is causing that pain? That pain? Yeah, yeah, rotator cuff surgery is painful. Um, I mean, there's different ways. A lot of times the surgery is done open. You know, that's previously what was done where a large or a mini open, sorry, incision is made. But you can get pain from that, the soft tissue dissection, et cetera. Pocal surgery is a little bit better. Arthroscopic surgery in terms of pain is a little better in term, because you have less tissue damage. Um, the shoulder itself is, is lined with nerve endings, things like that. When you sleep at night, laying down puts a lot of pressure. The shoulder kind of really kind of experiences that pain. So it, it is a, a painful surgery, but now we have nerve blocks and things like that to help people get out of that painful period for longer periods of time. It's not pain free. I wish it was, but it's not. <laughs> uh, Great the next question. question is who are who good candidates for hip arthroscopy? arthroscopy? Yeah, so hip arthroscopy, as I mentioned, you know, we see those those abnormalities in the in the socket and the ball causing arthritis down the line. Now, if somebody already has arthritis, this is not what it's treated for. We're not going there and removing arthritis. And once again, we can't repave the whole road. Um, that's a hip replacement if you have hip arthritis. We the best candidate is a patient who already does not have arthritis. So younger patients are more ideal for hip arthroscopy. We've seen under age 40 is a little bit of better outcomes. There, there are actually significantly better outcomes than patients over age 40 who have already gone on to arthritis. The other thing we can check is the joint space itself. And on x-ray, we measure how much space is there. If it's below a certain amount, no matter how much bone we take out or labrum we fixed, it's not going to help the arthritis. So we, we like patients to have who already have not had arthritis. As, as good candidates for hip arthroscopy. And a similar, and a similar question. question. Mm -hmm. Who are good candidates for the cartilage regenerative techniques? Technique. Yeah, so also another good question. It's kind of the same philosophy. It, it's it's when we don't have arthritis once again. You know, ideal candidates are patients with focal cartilage deficits, which means like a pothole, one area that's worn out, not the whole knee. If the whole knee's worn out, it's not like we can repaste your own cartilage everywhere knee replacement is better. Um, it, it just doesn't work. You know, we need a focal deficit and it has to be um, pretty discreet and, 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 and contained. So once again, those tend to be younger patients, et cetera. Um, and, and it's kind of the same indications in terms of hips. So with, so the, with regeneration, the regeneration, do they, do they have, have to, to uh, uh, like, does like, that, does that last, last for a long, long time? time? Does, does it, it reoccur over, over a period of time? time? Yeah, um, we you know the long term stat studies over 20 years have showed good results, and you know there have been different types of studies where you go in with an MRI and look again. There's been second looks where people put the camera in, and I've been in the second looks where we take a probe and we feel that cartilage, and it looks pretty much like your day you're born. And if you looked at it 
from histologic standpoint, we can see there may be some minor changes, but you know, with those cartilage regeneration techniques, they're pretty darn good. We're, we're, we're evolving them still, but we're looking at 20 year uh, data that's showing satisfaction. You know, may, it may not be all saying, hey, look at every MRI, but it may be patient satisfaction in terms of less pain, the ability to do what you want to do. So um, we're pretty darn close, I would say, in terms of keeping it to the regular cartilage. And, and a lot of those factors are also exogenous to the knee as well, in terms of rehab musculature and weight. Any other, Any other question, question from anybody else? else? Well, thank well, you thank a lot, Dr. Anuraj. Yes. And um, the, event the event number, number again, again is 44432. And, and you can find that email, email um, in, the in the WebEx, WebEx invite, invite so that you so can go in and retrieve your CME. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank, everybody. thank you thank very you much for the here. opportunity. Thank you, Nicole. Bye. 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 Bye-bye.